Thank you and good afternoon. So this afternoon we'll uh, start with presenting the numbers and then we'll go through uh, some of the updated of the modeling and the epidemiology of COVID-19 here in BC. So today we have 13 new cases who have tested positive for COVID-19 in BC, bringing our total to 2,835 people who have been uh, positive for the for COVID-19. Uh, that includes 960 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,480 people in the Fraser Health Region, 131 people in Vancouver Island Health Region, 199 people in the Interior Health Region, and 65 people in the Northern Health Region. We have no new health care or community outbreaks today. Uh, we have seven active outbreaks in our health care system, six in long-term care and one in acute care. And we've had an uh, increase of three residents affected to bring that total to uh, 372 residents of uh, long-term care or acute care and 227 staff. Um, in terms of our active cases, we have 174 active cases of whom 16 people are in hospital in BC, seven of whom are in critical care or ICU. We have one new death today, um, also a person from long-term care, bringing our total number of people who have died from COVID-19 to 170. And our condolences go out to the family of this person, to his care team and his entire community. Um, we have uh, 2,491 people who have now fully recovered from COVID-19. So I'm going to move into our uh, our modeling um, as we're talking about it. it. This is our going forward. Um, again, we've been transitioning, as people know, in our restart program uh, to. Uh, uh, phase two and um, as we move forward over the next couple of weeks we'll be moving into the next phase. So to start off with I want to update us on the epidemiology so how and where um, people have been affected in British Columbia and uh, we'll start with our epidemic curve so we've seen this before and this is now updated um, to include up until uh, June 21st so uh, 2,822 cases and as you can see we managed to flatten our curve very effectively in BC although we continue to have cases and we know that we continue to have cases as we moved into our restart and we started to have more activity in our communities. So what we have in this is not just those people who've been diagnosed through a laboratory test but also from the beginning of May when we started our restart we've had a number of people who have uh, had this disease but have not had a test for a variety of reasons and we call those people epidemiologically linked cases and we've had a number of those as well that you can see in purple on this graph. Um, also uh, today I wanted to report uh, our epidemic curve so this is very similar to what you just saw but reported by the likely source of the infection and there's a couple of really important things to note in this. Um, one is the purple at the bottom. So those are the cases that are occurring in our community that are not linked, that we weren't able to connect to a cluster or an outbreak or know where their, their source of transmission came from. And you can see during the March period of time where we had our large number of cases, there was quite a lot of transmission in our community. And that's what these cases reflect. As we've moved into May and June, those cases have gone down quite dramatically. And I've said many times that's one of the indicators that we're watching to see how we're doing. And we still have a small number of cases that arise that we aren't able to determine where their infection came from. But those are very small numbers. More importantly, we are able to link the vast majority of cases that we have and particularly in recent days, recent weeks, almost all of our cases have been linked and we still continue ha to have imported cases. So the pink, uh, the orangey pink are cases that are associated with international travel. Um, we had quite a lot of those early on and more recently we continue to have cases primarily in Canadians and people from BC who are returning from other countries around the world including most recently India as well. We know we've had uh, a number of cases in uh, temporary foreign workers who've been in uh, to work in our agricultural industry. Um, as we had an outbreak early on in, in April 
since that time, the province has been providing accommodations for all of our temporary foreign workers who've come into BC for the 14-day quarantine period. And as of today, we've had uh, 27 people who have developed in um, COVID-19 while in their quarantine period or um, soon after arriving primarily um, in temporary foreign workers from Mexico. So we do believe that having the quarantine services that we've provided for people means that we can support them if they get sick and make sure they have what they need to effectively isolate before they go into the farms and, and provide that necessary essential work in the farms here in BC. Uh, the next slide uh, talks about the geographic distribution. So this is an update of what we presented last time, um, uh, which is cases by the health service delivery area, so smaller geographical areas. So the cumulative total is uh, every, all the cases that we've had since uh, the beginning of the year. And then on the right, we have the number of cases in the last 14 days. And as you can see from that, from the numbers that we've been presenting every day, the vast majority of our cases in the last couple of weeks have been in the Fraser Health region, particularly the Fraser East region, as well as Vancouver. Um, but we have had a smattering of cases both in the interior, uh, the north, and most recently on Vancouver Island. Uh, the next series of graphs, again, are an updated of, of uh, uh, case rates that we have presented before. And we can see that BC continues to have very low rates of confirmed cases per million population. So that's a rate so we can compare with other uh, jurisdictions. Um, so compared to the rest of Canada, but also to a number of other countries. Um, what's concerning, of course, in this uh, schematic is um, the, the increase that we continue to see in a number of countries, particularly the U.S., which uh, we know is, um, directly affects us, but also a number of other countries like Brazil, where cases are rapidly increasing. On the right-hand side, it, it compares us to other provinces in Canada, and we can see that we remain low, like a number of other provinces. And um, reassuringly on this, we can see that both Quebec and Ontario have leveled off as well, which is good news for all of us. Uh, the next slide presents uh, the similar information, an update on our death rate comparison um, compared to other countries. And we can see that um, BC uh, remains quite low, which is good news for us, and compared to uh, other provinces in Canada, where we also uh, remain quite low. Uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about today uh, was uh, some of the new things that we're doing in our community. And one of these is a is a fascinating project that's being uh, worked on at the, the Public Health Lab at the BC Centre for Disease Control, where we have some expertise in, in assessing water samples for uh, communicable diseases. And uh, they are working um, to develop a way to be able to monitor wastewater across the province as an indicator of when the virus may be in our communities. And this is something that we've seen in a number of other countries around the world. Uh, the Netherlands had started a program, Finland and Germany, and recently Italy has reported out on uh, the, some of the sampling that they did retrospectively, which showed that they were able to find COVID uh, RNA, so the genetic material from the virus, in uh, wastewater samples from December and January uh, of this year. Um, indicating that there must there was likely circulation in some parts of of northern Italy prior to it being recognized in the community, so this is a project that we're working with uh, other groups across the country. Um, but right now, in developing the methodology, there's been testing of wastewater in the Vancouver uh, facility, which covers some parts of of Surrey as well. Um, and for the last five weeks, uh, there has been testing done, and we have had no positives, which reflects the low level of transmission that we are seeing in communities right now. Um, so this is something that we're planning on rolling out and using in the coming months, particularly in smaller communities as a way of helping us understand if there's been transmission in that community. And this is building on work that's been done around the world to help monitor for polio, which is also a, a viral infection that's shed in, in stool and into wastewater. So more to come on that as, as, these, uh, um, as these projects roll out. 
Finally, I want to talk about uh, some of our modeling and analysis and the things that we've been doing and where we are in terms of, of uh, the impact of the restart program here in BC. So this is again an update of some of the mobility patterns that we've been following over time in British Columbia. And we can see that we are gradually returning slowly and carefully uh, to more activities in our community. Um, that we're spending less time always at home and more time in places like workspaces, retail, recreation spaces. spaces. Um, and that's uh, what we expect as we've moved into this new stage. Um, so the mobility metrics are generally increasing, but they are re remain lower than the seasonal norms based on data from uh, previous years. This is an update as well of the dynamic compartmental modeling that uh, we have been doing. And as you can see, we've moved along along the trajectory of this. And it uses things like the mobility data, like some of the network analysis that we have uh, in the province to help us get an understanding of what could happen if we uh, continue along the trajectory that we are. So right now, the model suggests that we are uh, had a slight increase in new cases, which we have seen, and that our contact rates, so the rates of, of activity, mobility, and contacts have gone up to somewhere around 65% of normal. So you will recall when we first presented this information, when we put in the public health measures that um, had people mostly staying at home, staying apart, not going into uh, most retail workplaces, we were down around 30% of our usual contacts. As we've started uh, the restart, we moved up to somewhere around 40% and we're now somewhere around 60, 65%. And I'm intentionally saying that is not a, an exact. And one of the reasons why it is not exact other than it's a model, is the fact that we have um, very small numbers of cases. And when you have small numbers, um, you can get a wide variation in, uh, in the prediction models. So they're what we call unstable numbers. And what we can see that from the, the wideness of the pink bars that surround the line that we see there. So small numbers give us a sense of where we are, but uh, can um, but are difficult to, to pinpoint. So we are somewhere around 60, 65% of normal, but it could be a little bit more and it could be a little bit less. What this helps us understand is that we are in a place where we are having more contact in our communities, and we all know that. We can see that. We're out going to work, we're going shopping, we're doing things that we did before. But what this also tells us with the small numbers and the fact that we're not seeing increases, dramatic increases in hospitalizations or people in ICU, is that many of those contacts are done in a safe way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is uh, the scenarios that could come out of where we are. And as we see, um, you know, somewhere around 60, we're somewhere in that 50, 60, 70 percent range. If we go dramatically increased, so into 80 percent or back to what used to be normal, we can expect to see that we will have more cases and we run the potential risk of having dramatically increase a rapid rebound in new cases. So that is what we want to avoid. We need to stay where we are, where we're having safe contacts and we're not seeing dramatic increases in number of cases. This is an, a new um, projection that is based on what we call the reproductive number. So the reproductive number is a, the, a reflection of how many people a case will transmit to when they become ill. And early on, that reproductive number was quite high because we weren't recognizing uh, new cases and they were transmitting. They had lots of people they were in contact with. And we know from data I presented before that on average, um, a, a case had 11 people that they were in contact with, but some of them it was many, many more than that. So this gives us a sense of what we've done and what we have done in British Columbia by taking the measures that we've done together, we've flattened that and we've brought that down below one. So that means that not everybody transmits and imagine most people don't transmit to anybody after they develop symptoms themselves. And we were quite flat but well below one, uh, well into May. 
once we did start to increase our contacts, to have increase our bubbles, to have more contact with other people, that rose. But we've been hovering around one, which is where we need to stay preferably slightly below one, which allows us to increase our, our activity, make sure we get our, our social connections, our economic connections going without um, having rapid increase in numbers of people who are exposed and infected. So that's our threshold, as we call it. So, the, so these models um, are calibrated using our BC data and it really helps us understand that they're illustrative. They're not predictive of what's going to happen. They tell us a lot about where we are right now and give us a sense of what we need to do going forward. It's important to remember when we look at these models that they are, um, th that multiple actions were put in place and they cannot um, detect all of those actions. So if we have more contact in retail spaces, for example, and we're going out to more places or we're going to restaurants, it is reflected in the increased activity that we see in the models. But it, what's not reflected is that we're doing it in a safe way. That means we have barriers, for example, the plexiglass between me and the cashier at the grocery store, or the, um, the, the space around the table that I'm sitting at on the patio. Those are things that are safe contacts. And what we can see from our models is, even though we're having more contacts, we're doing it in a way that is preventing transmission of infections. The other key thing about that, of course, is that we need to maintain control of our epidemic here in BC. We need to continue to do these foundational pieces. We need to continue to have small uh, numbers of contacts, to have small groups in big spaces, to maintain our safe distances, to make sure that if we're feeling unwell, that we stay away from others, stay away from work, stay away from um, going out. And that uh, the other piece, of course, that helps us in all of this is the contact tracing that we do in public health to make sure that we can connect it with anybody who may be at risk because they've been exposed. And as we know, there's nothing we can do right now to prevent you from getting sick if you've had close contact with somebody with the virus. What we can do is support you to stay away from others so that you're not passing it on, particularly to those that you're closest to. And how we do that is through the public health work of uh, contact tracing and contact management. So these contact tracing models are ones that we've been looking at with BC data over the last uh, number of weeks. And what it tells us is that as we've relaxed our distancing, as we've had more contacts in our community, we need to make sure that public health has the resources and that we're able to both quickly and completely find people who may be at risk. When we have moderate distancing measures in place, uh, which I would say we are at right now, we need to find about 75% of people within one to three days to be able to effectively control the epidemic. As we're moving into our next phase, where we know we're going to have more activity, where we know um, that we're going to be moving more, we need to continue to be able to effectively find people. And our, our dilemma is that we have to find that balance because we need to find um, more complete contact tracing within a shorter frame of time. So we need to find everybody within a few days. And we are good at that. We've shown the data from BC where we have um, effectively found 97 to 99 percent of contacts within 48 hours after a case is identified. So these are the scenarios that we're working towards now, making sure that we all do our part, which means making sure that, uh, that we are keeping our bubbles small, but also that we know the people that we're with. These are why some of the measures that we have in place to make sure that we have a contact information for people. That if I'm going to a, a church meeting, that I have a, a ability to identify who's been at that meeting. So that if somebody does inadvertently come in with symptoms and we find them in public health, we're able to connect with people quickly and prevent transmission. So this is our, our conclusions. As we've relaxed distancing measures, the strong contact tracing in BC has provided a buffer against renewed growth of cases. 
As we further relax, the completeness and the rapidity of this contact tracing will be even more important. And in combination with things like we have been doing and with staying home if we're sick, those are the things that are going to get us through the next few months. And that is what is going to help us manage this pandemic as we open up both our, our societal connections, our business connections and our family connections. So these models show we are increasing our contacts and we know that. But we're doing it in a safe way. And to continue to safely increase our contacts, we need to maintain the measures we have in place and ensure we're well supportive public health teams efficiently and thoroughly undertake contact tracing around the province and then we can make it through these next few months and then into the fall. So this modeling shows us that in BC the measures we have in place to protect ourselves, each other, our communities, combined with our slow gradual transition in through phase two and into phase three is working. We have eased our restrictions in a way that has allowed us to increase our social and economic interactions while keeping our new cases low. 65% is where we need to be, so we need to expand into phase three with maintaining what we have now. We have, until we have an effective treatment or a vaccine, these rules for safe social interactions must continue to be maintained as part of our everyday life. We know that if we go too far and let that number get too high, we risk a resurgence and we have seen that happen in other parts of the world. We all know what we must do. The foundations of our safety are clear. Always stay home if you're ill. Always follow good hand hygiene. Always maintain a safe distance when you can and use barriers to protect us when we need to be in within that safe distance. A non-medical mask is also part of what we can do when we can't always consistently maintain a safe distance. As individuals, we also have an important role to play in contact tracing. It is in public health a team effort or a team sport that all of us need to be committed to, to be successful. Our responsibility is to keep our bubbles small know the people that we are with, that we have those, con those um, close contacts over time with. This, give public, this gives public health teams the ability to notify everybody who may be at risk and contain the spread as quickly as possible. So this approach applies to all of us, no matter where we may be, whether it's at home, at work, in our community, or traveling to other parts of British Columbia or Canada. We know that closed spaces, large crowds, contact, close contact with people over time are the things that are riskier and we need to do those with caution. So be respectful and understanding of others. That has what has got us this far in British Columbia and we need to continue together to do our part to protect our province, our community, our elders and our families. Let's continue to find that balance and to maintain that balance as a community as we chart our path forward. And let's all do it, of course, by being kind with each other, being calm and being safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And uh, I wanted to start by uh, uh, joining Dr. Henry and on behalf of uh, the Premier and the government and passing on our condolences uh, to the person who passed away from COVID-19 in Vancouver Coastal Health in the last 24 hours in long-term care. Uh, this is a very significant loss for the family and for the community and for the caregivers involved. It always is, and this is the 170th person to pass away, and everyone, especially in these times when we are continuing to stay apart from one another more, uh, it's so important for us to support one another in these times. And so we're thinking of them today in their sorrow and their grief, and we pass on our condolences to them. I wanted to uh, just note a couple of things in today's numbers, uh, and then just briefly talk about the the presentation by Dr. Henry, and then we'll move on quickly to questions. The first is to is to note, and it's important when we discuss um, the issue of contract tra contact tracing and the issue of supports in public health. 
we have developed a team uh, that was always there. This is the bread and butter work of public health, but a team of people who has done this work for us. It was hugely important, the work of public health, particularly in February and March, in slowing the rise of COVID-19 in BC and giving us the opportunity to take other measures. And it is as important today as it was then. Equally, so are the measures that individuals need to take. I wanted to note that we've had, since the beginning of COVID-19, 74 new or returning registrants uh, amongst doctors, 74, and 2,122 in nursing. That goes from registered nurses and registered psychiatric nurses and nurse practitioners, LPNs, care aides. Many of those have supported our efforts, of course, in long-term care, but they've also provided and continue and will continue to provide a significant backbone to our system as we continue to, to need to, in, to invest and have outstanding contact tracing in BC as we continue to deal with COVID-19. We want to thank all of those people who have joined the profession, come back to the profession, and are in those professions for all the work they've done in public health, which I think is truly exceptional. On uh, March 27th, we presented our first modeling report. Today's report was our fifth, our 100th media presentation. Each has given us new perspectives on COVID-19. Our first presentation drew on the experience of other jurisdictions, you'll recall, in showing our product progress and what we needed to do in BC and in setting out the task ahead of, uh, ahead of us in our ongoing BC response. As Dr. Henry said at that first session, we had started to see a flattening of the curve. We had started to slow down the number of new cases. There were many reasons for that, but as Dr. Henry noted, our success, even at that early point, was driven by physical distancing. Physical distancing, I'm sure that all of all the phrases we've used over the many months, those two words have made the greatest difference in our effort to slow the spread. And they are as important, more important today than ever. Today's modeling explores what happens if our commitment to physical distancing weakens. It shows what happens if we let up on physical distancing. It shows us once again that physical distancing saves lives. And as we do more in our society, as we emerge through phases of our response to COVID-19, what we do, our responsibility, all of us, is as important as ever. Underlying all our BC COVID-19 efforts, and as powerful as the act of physical distancing is trust, we have each driven ourselves to use the skills that Dr. Henry has taught us to stop the spread, and we trust each other to continue, continue to do the same. The glimmer of success we saw at that March 27th modeling has endured. It has brought us to where we are today. We're doing what's required of us, and we have good reason to trust that others are doing the same. We're counting on each other, trusting each other to stop the spread. And today's results show that we must continue to do what's working. It is as important now as it ever was. Physical distancing saves lives. It's the kindest gesture we can offer to each other, and it is the strongest defense against spreading the disease. There are others. Never, never go to work sick, washing our hands. All that we have learned that physical distancing remains important. Trust is a critical part of our BC COVID-19 journey. The actions that build this trust happen because we stayed 100% all in in our effort to stop the spread. We're counting on each other because that has made all the difference and we will continue to make, need to make that difference in the days and the weeks and the months ahead. Aujourd'hui, nous annonçons 13 nouveaux cas qui ont testé positifs pour COVID-19 pour un total de 2835 cas en Colombie-Britannique. Il y a un nouveau décès lié au COVID-19 dans le régime de santé de Vancouver Coastal pour un total de 170 décès en Colombie-Britannique. Nous continuons à offrir nos condoléances à tous ceux qui, qui ont perdu leurs proches durant cette pandémie. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 16 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 7 en soins intensifs. Les autres personnes dont le test d'épissage a été positif sont en isolement à leur domicile. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are uh, you will get one question and one follow up. Uh, also, please take your phones off mute. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question this afternoon is from Shannon Patterson, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, first question, you have said in the past that phase three would include hotels, overnight camping, movie theaters, 
TV and film production and interprovince travel. Uh, considering these levels, are you still comfortable with all of those things? And if so, what kind of spike in cases would you need to see to consider pulling back from phase three? Yeah, so I, I think um, it, it's always been a gradual transition and what we've tried to do is say that we, we want to start off with the things that we need to get going first um, and make sure we have those um, uh, the guidance in place to support different industries in opening over time. And so, yes, I do think we're in the place where we can move to uh, supporting the safe opening of other uh, parts of our economy, other parts parts of, of business and including uh, travel, particularly, you know, people traveling within BC and going to experience uh, the rest of British Columbia in the summer, uh, the summer months right now. So it, it's not about seeing a spike in cases. What I'm hopeful and what we have shown as as we're doing this in a, in a measured, thoughtful way, um, we are able to keep the, those um, cases low. So we'll be watching again um, to make sure that we're not having uh, um, people pop up in the community that aren't linked. Those are really important. We're watching those. We're looking at outbreaks. But it is the foundation that we can move ahead on is keeping those distances, keeping things low and slow, having fewer faces and bigger spaces. We keep saying those because those are the things that work and that are going to help us. If we did start to see increases in hospitalization in particular and ICU cases, those are warning signs to us. And we would need to modify what we're doing. But right now, we're in a good place. We know what to do and we can do it in all of the places that we are expanding into. It doesn't change the foundation that we have and that we're, we're doing right now, which is around us each um, doing the right thing, as well as having the, um, the backbone of public health to support us in doing that. Do you have a follow-up, Shannon? I do, yes. Uh, given the spikes we're seeing in cases in certain states, along with the specter of a second wave here, how likely is it that we're going to see British Columbians allowed to travel south of the border at any time during 2020? Yeah, well, um, I don't know about allowed because it's on both sides of the border that uh, non-essential travel is being discussed. Um, it's very concerning what we're seeing in the in some parts of the U.S., particularly uh, you know some of the the larger southern states where um, hospitalizations again are dramatically going up. So not just. Um, because of testing, but because people are still transmitting widely in the community. And so that's a risk to us. Um, what I can say is that if anybody does go to the U.S. Um, or outside of the country, we uh, continue to have quarantine orders in place when they come back. And that's to protect our communities here. So if somebody is exposed and they come back to British Columbia, then they'll need to stay in quarantine for 14 days and we'll support them in doing that. But that's very important so that we we don't have a lot of reintroductions into um, into a very fragile balance that we have here in BC that is working for us. Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. On um, increasing our contacts, Dr. Henry, if we're around 60 or 65 percent at this point, at what point do you start getting nervous about what comes next and, and how much increase do we anticipate phase three will bring? Yeah, so this is my nervous level. So we want to stay right about where we are. And I don't see it as changing in, in phase three. Um, what it's telling us is that we have been, we've, we've increased the number of places we're going, the spaces that we're going to, the activity. And as we gradually move into um, more um, things like hotels and spas and travel, we are going to increase those contacts. But we all, each of us, have to keep that, um, those bubbles small. And that is what is going to maintain us uh, not having rapid growth of the, of, uh, of the virus. So you know I talk about some of the things that I don't see changing in the coming months. Things like uh, re restricting gatherings uh, to 50 people. 
And there's two reasons for that. One is because it, you know, you somebody brings that inadvertently into a, a wedding or a celebration or a party um, with 50 people. We know that a good portion of those people in a, that type of close contact may become infected. And what we don't want is for them to all go out and infect other people, and we get into an explosively increasing phase. So with 50 people, we know most of those people. We can find them quickly. So it's partly not giving um, wood for the fire, but it's also partly our, our ability to find people quickly and, and to um, put in the measures that we need to break those chains of transmission. So I don't see us rapidly increasing. I think uh, what I see is us maintaining this balance, maintaining this balance as we continue to do more things in our communities. Do you have a follow-up, Richard? Yeah, I do, Lindsay. Um, you mentioned there are bubbles, and there I've been getting a lot of emails about people asking about their social bubbles. When we entered phase two, the phrase was double the bubble. Where are we at now in terms of bubbles? Can, can people expand them anymore to see more family or more friends that they may not have been able to uh, be in touch with yet? Yeah, so I, I think that's where um, the nuance comes and um, because as we're moving into this phase, we know there's a couple of things that are happening. People are going to be traveling more, so we are going to see more family. We know that more people are going back to work. We know as well um, and we need to find the balance in doing that. Uh, things like sports leagues and, and summer camps for kids are starting. So that means we are, by the nature of those activities, increasing our connections, our social networks in those areas. So we need to be mindful of our own circumstance. As we did when we moved into phase two, we slowly, cautiously um, increased our bubble. We need to do that again, but having those important um, caveats in place. So if I have people in my family who are going through cancer treatment, or if I have people in my family who are elderly or have um, some illnesses that they're dealing with and I have children that are going to summer camp. I may not want to increase my bubble any more than that. I'll need to maintain that, um, that uh, protective um, uh, amount of contact around those people. So we have to make those decisions for ourselves and we have to be very wary of who it is that we might be impacting when we're having increased contacts. But I do think we are at a place where we can do um, cautiously more social connection, things that we need to help us, you know, to see our families, to see our friends, but to do it in a safe way. Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, just based on Twitter, a lot of people seem rather alarmed at this 65% uh, uh, figure of, of the contact interactions. Um, but can you elaborate? I know you gave some examples during the technical briefing uh, that could help give some context perhaps on, on how the modeling can't entirely account for some of our human measures that, that we've been putting into place, which I assume is a reason why you're perhaps not as alarmed? Yeah, I guess I'm sort of <laughs> in the middle. Um, one of the things that, that we talked about, and, and I mentioned it a little bit, so this model takes into effect uh, a whole bunch of different pieces of information about how we interact in our community in British Columbia. And then it looks at things like the cases, the outbreaks, the, um, the people who are hospitalized, and it helps us understand the relationship between those. But it's not a prediction. It's not telling us what can happen happen in the future. What it's told us, and one of the things right now, is we have still very small numbers of cases and we have small numbers of people in hospital. So that means the numbers are quite unstable. It means there's a wide confidence interval. So it, it tells us that yes, we're having more contacts, but those are mostly safe contacts. And that's good news to me. That means that what we're doing with everything that we've learned, and if we think of the transition that we've made through uh, when we had our um, you know, public health measures put in place and, and most of us were staying at home and not going out very often, we learned how to go to grocery stores in a safe way. It took us a while to figure that out. Then we learned in, as we started to open up again in our restart, how to go to other retail places. We started off with putting in place those um, uh, the guidance 
guidance to support a whole bunch of different areas opening up. So what this tells me is we're doing it right. People are being thoughtful. They're keeping their distance when they can, particularly around if you're out in a place where there's um, people that you don't know, like in grocery stores. We've put in those physical barriers that help protect us when we do need to be in close contact with each other. We've uh, put in um, measures that help us take transit safely, that help us um, and go to our office safely um, with small numbers of people. So we're not um, rapidly expanding and we're not seeing rapid transmission. We have had some cautionary tales. We've had uh, family gathering where there's been a lot of transmission. There's uh, certain workplaces and we've learned from those events to, to ensure that we can do it safely in other areas. So I think we need to continue that. We need to continue what we've been doing and doing it safely and I think what we need to expand to into the next area when we start to travel more is our travel manners, our travel rules, bringing those rules with us. So doing the same things if we go to uh, visit on Vancouver Island, um, making sure that we're doing the same things that we do at home, that we're being respectful of the community, that we're not overcrowding places, that we're not gathering in large groups. And that's what's going to allow us to continue to move through this, to increase our social and emotional interactions and also our you know our business our economy all of the other important things that we need right now we're in a we're in a strange place because until we have the ability to uh, protect the population from this virus either through an effective treatment or a vaccine we have to find a balance that's going to keep people from getting sick in large numbers and this is where we are. Um, we're at that sort of tail end. We flattened the curve, but we know cases are going to happen. We know as we get out there that this virus is still there. And even when we think it's gone from our communities, um, it can come back because we are uh, we, we need to travel. There's need, there needs to be connection, whether it's for essential goods or whether it's uh, seeing those family that need our support. And we see that from New Zealand, for example, where they've had introductions once they thought they had got rid of this virus. So we are going to have to find that, um, that balance of having more cases, but being able to manage them quickly and prevent ongoing transmission and making sure that we don't have to put in measures that have negative consequences for people like we have seen over the last few months. And that is social isolation, challenges with mental health, um, the fact that many people have lost their jobs and are dealing with the, um, the issues uh, that are related to that many of which are health issues. So we're at that point where we need to all come together and continue to protect each other and our families as best we can while we're moving ahead and supporting people um, to get through uh, what has been a very traumatic few months for us all as a community. Do you have a follow-up, Tanya? I do, and my follow-up is for my colleague because I forgot to ask at the beginning. If we could just get a response uh, in French, uh, just kind of on the overall idea behind the 65% level. Thank you. Oui, merci beaucoup. Juste pour dire que uh, l'idée uh, de de 65% uh, c'est un modèle, mais. Uh, Il est important de, de se souvenir du fait que ce qu'on fait dans la vie quotidienne compte, n'est-ce pas? Par, donc chaque action, chaque euh, voyage, si vous voulez, euh, doit mise en euh, Il faut mettre en place dans chaque chaque euh, euh, chaque fois qu'on quitte la maison euh, des mesures dans la vie pour pour suivre. Et pour limiter la transmission. Et c'est pour, pour une, je pense, pour une très belle raison, c'est que si on, il y a la, il y a transmission, ça va être quelqu'un proche de vous, quelqu'un peut-être que vous aimez, vos parents, vos grands-parents, vos frères, vos sœurs. Et pour cette raison-là, c'est absolument essentiel dans cette période où la société société s'ouvre de maintenir le cap en termes de la distance physique, la distance sociale. C'est plus important que jamais de maintenir le cap maintenant. Et ça, c'est ce que ces modèles demandent. Quand on est à 50, 65 %, c'est important. Mais ce qu'on fait, 
avec l'ouverture de la société, ça compte. Et c'est pour cette raison-là qu'on travaille plus fort, même qu'en avril, sur les contacts, pour, pour limiter les dégâts quand il y a euh, transmission. Et en même temps, ça reste important pour tout le monde de suivre les conseils de Dr. Henry. Next question is from Lisa Houston, News 1130. Hi, this is for Dr. Henry. I'm wondering about children and how confident we can be about kids not spreading the virus. I'm going to get personal to hope we can get a general one because I don't think we're the only ones dealing with this. We have two young children. We also have someone in our house who is older with cancer. Can we let our kids play with other kids and be relatively confident that they're not going to spread it because we haven't seen the spread happening in schools and obviously they've been near each other? Yeah, you know, this is a, a very challenging thing. And I was hoping to present some data today, but uh, we're still working on it. Um, but there's a nice uh, paper out of the Netherlands, which really helps us understand this a little bit. And it looked at um, transmission from young people to adults and from adults to young people. And the, the bottom line with it is there's a growing accumulation of evidence that uh, children do sometimes pass it on to each other. But for the most part, it, it, children get it from adults they don't pass it on to adults and they're much less likely than um, and when I'm talking about children we're talking about really um, children under the age of 10 in particular as we get older into our teens we're much more like young adults which the risk is lower but for young children in particular they don't seem to be as affected by it they don't seem to have a severe illness and they don't seem to pass it on to adults as effectively and most of the, the um, transmission to children has been uh, from a family member, an adult, to the child um, in those close contact family situations. So yes, I think we, we, and we've seen that in our school system. We've had young people who have tested positive in the last few weeks, but none of them have been related to schools, as far as I'm aware. So that's, that is reassuring to us. We always, of course, it, it's never absolute. So you do need to be careful and we need to make sure that if your children are um, going out, going to school, going to uh, play dates uh, or um, summer camps, that you check them carefully, make sure that they're not sick, that nobody else is sick in that environment and that they keep their group small. Um, and that helps protect your family as well. Do you have a follow-up, Lisa? I do for my colleague. Uh, the wastewater tracking, you talked a bit about who it will benefit in the tech briefing. I'm wondering if you can talk about that a bit here, about why we're bothering to do it. You mentioned uh, smaller communities. I, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. The, we talked about wastewater tracking. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's kind of an exciting thing. Um, we have some expertise that's quite unique here. So wastewater tracking um, is something that we're hoping to use as an indicator in, in smaller communities. So in uh, larger communities, as you can imagine, you have to uh, filter and get a small amount of uh, to test and it can be a challenge. But there is some evidence that we can use it to give a barometer of how much transmission there is in a community. But we're where I think it's going to be helpful for us is if we um, start to see cases um, one or two in a small community it, or um, we're worried about transmission in a community, we can test and use it to see if there is any evidence of community spread. So that's something that uh, we're still working on, um, well, around the world globally, but here in Canada, um, what is the, the valid protocol to do that? But I'm hoping by the fall in particular that we'll We'll have that as another tool in our surveillance toolkit uh, to help us, um, uh, particularly in more remote communities where it's a presence absence, um, can be very helpful. And we have time for one more question today. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released later this afternoon. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial health officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. 
Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks uh, very much for taking my question. I want to uh, talk about the United States again. Uh, just within the last hour, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee has ordered a mandatory rule for wearing masks in public statewide. It had been in the act, but it's now statewide. I know your position on mandatory masks that's where I'm not asking about that, but given what's happening in Washington State right now, and we do have people crossing the border back and forth who are essential service workers, but may contract the virus that seems to be rampaging through Washington State, it, do you have a concern of how that could affect potentially the timing of, of phase three or just start the next step that we're, we're about to take? Yeah, you know, it, it's very concerning watching what's going on in, in Washington. I, I know um, uh, they've been doing some really great work there in, in terms of the, the public health work and they're able to locate, uh, they, they have a couple of quite large outbreaks in and processing plants and things. I don't see it as affecting us. We do know that we have people, um, particularly truckers, who are going back and forth with essential goods across the border. But we have had that for some time and there is a process that they need to follow to self-monitor. Um, we, we know that there's uh, um, uh, measures being taken both when they're in the states and when they come back to make sure that uh, people aren't transmitting um, and that they're taking the measures to, to have safe physical distancing and things when they're in the U.S. So they are getting used to it as we all are learning about how to do that safely. Um, and we have had people who have returned from uh, trucking and, and others from the U.S. who've had symptoms, who've been tested and have not passed it on to others. So we need to continue to be sure uh, to monitor carefully and to make sure people get tested routinely as needed. Just, yeah. just to express our appreciation to the federal government for continuing the to not allow visitors and their agreements not to allow visitors back and forth i mean i think it's just clearly the right decision right now the evidence in washington state in oregon in california in nevada in arizona i know many many people visit the united states they visit some of those places in the course of a normal year this is not a normal year and the decisions that have been taken not to allow visitors are important equally the decisions we've taken on the essential worker side, whether it's in agriculture with temporary foreign workers in British Columbia, have had a very strong impact since the, the one uh, significant outbreak that happened early on in our pandemic time back in April. Uh, the fact that we have isolated people when they've come, temporary foreign workers when they've come, separate from the farms has made an enormous difference. These measures need to continue. And it's why we've continued to pursue those things and what the difference they've made. Other jurisdictions, jurisdictions in Canada have had hundreds of, of uh, workers sick uh, and who had, where those measures haven't been taken. We have to continue to take these measures. It's a real tribute to our Ministry of Agriculture here in BC, to our public health officials that, that we've done that in those cases. In the case of travel to the United States, it tells us, unfortunately, and some extraordinary work has been done in Washington State that we're going to have to, I think, for some time continue to hold the line on the issue of visitors to and from the United States. With that, thank you very much and look forward to seeing you Thursday. Follow up, hang on, sorry, two oh, seconds. Keith, you did you have a follow up? <laughs> follow up if I could. Uh, for Dr. Henry, just in reference to your, um, your comment, we're in a strange point in our the pandemic right now. In the earlier brief, you, you used the word philosophical, where a philosophical point, which I think was, in re, if I read it right, was in regards to making sure we sort of obey the rules and, and, and in terms of enforcing them and such. Could you elaborate on what you mean by a philosophical point? You know, it's um, obviously I've been consumed with this as many of us have for many months and we're at a point where we want things to go back to normal. We, we don't want to have to deal with this anymore, but um, we know that there's downsides to that. So philosophically, we have to be at that point where we're willing to continue to have our, our community sacrifice that we're doing to be able to open up and to deal with some of the unintended negative consequences of the, of the actions we've had to take to make sure that we don't get overwhelmed in our health system and that um, many more people don't get infected and don't die. So we, we're, we're, we're in a good place in that we've had success in that, but we can't let up. We have to continue to take these measures to support each other to do the right thing in the coming months and it's going to be months 
you know, I would have liked way back when, when we were hopeful that it actually, we could get this back into nature. We're not there and we're seeing this around the world, that we have to be committed to staying together, to doing the same things that we have been doing, and that will allow us to do more. Um, we also have to philosophically accept that there is a risk that we're going to have, we absolutely are going to have more cases, but we may have more outbreaks in our long-term care homes. We may have more um, cases that spread and that we'll have to manage, and it may take um, community efforts to, to stop doing certain things. And we have to be accepting that some communities are not ready to accept travelers, for example, during this period of time because they need to take other measures to protect their community and the structure of their community. So I think it's more around, it's a, it's a challenging place to be because we'd like everything to be okay. Um, and we're doing all right, but we need to find that balance and continue in that balance and work together with that um, in the coming months, and we will get through this. This is not going to be forever, but it is going to be for for now, and it's going to be likely into next year. So let's do it in a way that supports each other um, the best we can and allows us to do as much as we can um, without uh, putting all of our hard effort and work at risk. That's all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you.